So thank you for giving up your Saturday to come and be with us uh, this morning. Um, the world is changing. Uh, when I started campaigning on uh, illegal, immoral and illegitimate debt with Jubilee 2000 back in uh, 1996, and again, I'm sorry to have my back to you, <laughs> and, and the rest of the panel, apologies for that. Um, uh, debt was being used as a weapon uh, against the very poorest people in the world. Uh, it, it was being used as a method of enslaving them. It was part of the failed way of thinking at that time of this concept of uh, so-called free markets. Uh, of, of trickle-down economics where the obscene wealth of a few was excused away on the basis that it would somehow trickle down and the very <laughs> poorest in society would benefit. And, and that's fundamentally failed. We've seen that fail across Africa for the last two or three decades uh, and, and it's failing now in this country. Politicians in rich countries look the other way as a tacit approval of a corrupt system which they knew exploited Africa and the poorest countries. But at that time, it, it brought them votes. It at least kept their own people wealthy, fed and educated. Um, so in the 1990s, uh, we challenged that concept with uh, the Judeo-Christian concept of Jubilee, which basically allows for a reset of the economic system uh, every 50 years. Um, we challenged that with a global petition. You might have signed it. There's quite a few people here I'm seeing who, who I know were involved back in Jubilee 2000. That was the petition that we were signing back in the 1990s. Uh, and, and 24 million people signed that. Um, and, and it went a long way. Um, you know, absolutely wonderfully that $130 billion worth of debt cancellation was won for the very poorest countries. Yeah, we, we had an enormous impact at that time. Um, crucially, and this is the bit that we didn't do so well on, on the petition it says, um, we, call upon, we call upon the leaders of lending nations to write off these debts by the year 2000. We ask them to take effective steps to prevent such high levels of debt building up again. And, and that was the fundamental change in the system that we were looking for back then. And that never happened. The, the politicians of the day failed us on that point. We helped them to account for it, and they let us down. And we're still here, and we need to keep challenging them to change the system, because this is going to come back and hit us again. But what's happened is that greed has taken over. Um, that, and the greed in our financial system, that all-encompassing, irrational, incentivised, addictive greed to set into our financial sector. It's changed things. I don't want to call it an industry, it's not an industry, it only produces numbers on balance sheets. And the very richest, crucially what happened then is the very richest in our society chose to do something, uh, and that was to change their targets from just enslaving the very poorest countries, and they looked at Europe, and they looked at our own countries and they looked at our own people. And that's the fundamental change that I think we've seen over the last 20 years of their campaigning, is that the very richest um, haven't honoured national boundaries anymore, and they're prepared to exploit their own. And that's why we've seen what's going on in Greece. And it's so right that we stand with the people of Greece, because I, I have this personal theory that, that uh, the oligarchs and the very richest in society looked at Greece as the birthplace of democracy. And they thought that if we can defeat democracy in Greece, we can defeat it anywhere. And so going back, I think, I think if you remember June, I was standing in a field in, in Glastonbury when the, uh, the referendum was announced that there was going to be a, a, a the Greek people were going to get to decide on, on whether to bail out the banks or not. And we saw the banks rain down fire on the people of Greece. They did everything they, can, they could to subvert democracy, to frighten people into voting to bail out the bankers. And do you know what? The people of Greece voted no. Okay, they voted no. And they voted to resist the bankers. 
Now, since then, things have taken a, 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 a worse turn. Um, I mean, uh, uh, Tim Jones, who's here today, has some of his research has uh, said that 92% of the bailout money going to Greece hasn't gone to Greece. It's gone to bail out the European bankers. Yeah. It's gone to bail out banks in France and Germany. And it's wrong that our democracy is subverted in order to pay back reckless lenders. We have to expose this greed at every turn. That's why we're here today. We need to um, educate ourselves. We need to educate each other. We need to inspire ourselves, we need to inspire each other. We've got a wonderful uh, uh, panel of speakers here today. We have a very uh, wonderful number of speakers addressing us throughout the day out sessions. I'd like to encourage you to go to as many sessions as you can, to learn as much as you can, to share with each other, because we're all campaigners. We can all share things. And so at the end, uh, over tea and coffee, I'd encourage you to just get together uh, to talk to think about what the next steps can be, to swap contact numbers, to swap phone numbers, to agree with people that you are local to, to meet up. Uh, because there's a sense here that, that today we need to, I want to recommit myself to reinvigorate my campaigning to take on the enslavement of debt that we're facing. We need to defeat this. So I'd like to uh, encourage you just to, to get together to plan, to plot, so that the space that we create at the end of the day, uh, when we're able to start to, to talk about the next steps we take to challenge debt, um, that we'll be in the right place for that. So, I'd just like to encourage you to enjoy the day, um, go to as many sessions as you can. Uh, I'd like now to pass over to uh, our director, uh, Sarah, uh, who will introduce the rest of the day to us. Thank you. Roger. Um, so um, I think as Roger said, um, we, no one here needs any reminding really. Um, the very fact that you're here shows that you know that debt is a central tool in a global economic system that is broken and that is hurting ordinary people everywhere. Um, we're 40 years into the global neoliberal experiment. Um, we are seeing increasing frequency of debt crises all over the world. We're seeing ever increasing inequality. I think the latest Oxfam statistic is that the richest 1% are going to own more than everyone else in the whole world by 2016. Um, and we're also seeing that more and more people are being caught in the debt trap, in the debt poverty trap more and more countries being caught in the debt austerity trap. Um, and as Roger also said, the Jubilee is an, an ancient um, idea which has um, historically um, set things straight a bit, levelled the playing field, allowed for justice to be done. Um, in ancient times it involved the, the freeing of the slaves, redistribution of land um, and writing off of debts. Um, and as Roger also said, many people in this room were involved in um, a pretty amazing Jubilee victory, the Jubilee 2000 movement, which cancelled 135, 136, I always get the number a bit wrong, um, billion um, debt for um, 36 countries. Um, but uh, what we're realising more and more is that the fundamental structures which underpin the, the global debt system remained intact, unfortunately, and the problem of debt was even greater than um, what we expected at the time. Um, and so this plenary, this opening plenary, um, and we're going to get into a lot more sort of detail and strategising throughout the day, but this opening plenary is to sort of look big picture and visionary, really. What is it we're trying to achieve now? What would a modern day... Um, Jubilee look like. Um, and we've got three really amazing uh, speakers, tireless debt campaigners and activists to um, uh, give you their thoughts on that. Um, and starting with my right, um, we've got Damon Gibbons, who's the Director of Centre for Responsible Credit. Um, Damon's author of Britain's Personal Debt Crisis, How We Got Here and What to Do About It. Um, he's been um, campaigning tirelessly for better regulation of the finance sector for um, over 15 years. And he was particularly influential in the campaign for the cap on the day lenders. Hopefully, some of you, lots of you, will have seen that um, uh, last year. Uh, January. January. 
um, to my left, I've got Anne Pettifor. Um, Anne was one of the leaders of the Jubilee 2000 movement. Um, she's now Director of Policy Research in Macroeconomics, Prime. Um, her book, The Coming First World Debt Crisis, was published in 2006, very prescient, two years before the actual First World Debt Crisis. Um, and she's recently published Just Money, How Society Can Break the Despotic Power of Finance and also recently been appointed to Jeremy Corbyn's advice, Economic Advisory Committee. And joining us from one of our sister organisations in Ghana, we're really pleased to welcome Bernard Anaba. Um, Bernard is a policy, analysis, policy analyst for ESODEC, which is the Integrated Social Development Centre in Ghana. Um, it's an indigenous NGO committed to the promotion of human rights um, and social justice for all, particularly working um, in support of the interests of the marginalised and vulnerable people. So without further ado, um, and also just to, to mention there's lots of uh, space for discussion and participation, we've got lots of participation, participation throughout the day, um, we're going to keep this opening plenary quite short, so we're just going to hear from the speakers um, and give you the opportunity to, to hear their thoughts. Um, so starting first of all on um, a jubilee, what the community can pay, I'm going to pass over to Damon. Thank you. That's a drop me in payroll. Wherever you want. Would you prefer it if I stood up? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I am standing up. <laughs> Can I just say uh, thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for the introduction and for quoting the book title in full. Otherwise, I get known as the author of Britain's personal debt crisis. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will be a bit careful about that. I'm also extremely pleased to be here uh, today for a couple of reasons. Actually, back in 1999, that I set up a campaign called Debt on Our Doorstep, uh, which was a network of debt advice agencies, credit unions, uh, trade unions, church groups and the like, which were concerned about high cost lending in working class communities, particularly door to door money lenders like Provident Financial, who were charging at that time, I think about 65 pounds for every 100 pounds that they lent out. Mm -hmm. And we called the campaign Debt on Our Doorstep as a reference to Jubilee 2000 actually. So it was debt on our doorstep, as in here in the UK, uh, but it was also a reference to uh, the money lenders who actually came door to door selling their loans and making their collections and so forth. So I'm delighted, really, that I, I think recently uh, you broadened or are thinking of broadening your remit in Jubilee uh, to focus on the UK as well. So that's, that's been my sort of long-standing uh, concern. And that concern really came out of just the, the lived experience of meeting uh, lone parents, as it was at the time, in Redditch. I was a, a debt advice worker for Redditch Borough Council and hearing of all the pressures in the run-up to Christmas that they were under and the exploitation of, uh, that was uh, being made of them by companies like Providence. So we started a campaign. Uh, I remember one of the first sort of comments we had back from the, the national media. We, we did get a good coverage uh, from The Guardian, a nice spread, you know, in a sort of Saturday edition and stuff like that. Got on to uh, BBC TV and the radio and all the like. Uh, but the comments that, that were made back at the time, was, it, was all, it was all very different coverage. It was the first time that working class experience of, of uh, debt and how it created poverty and its interaction with that was actually covered in the media. It was all, at that time, just best buys for credit cards or mortgages and the sort of typical personal uh, finance coverage <coughs> in the press. So if nothing else, I, I think we did, over a long period of time, start to change the debate and actually get, get some focus into policy making about the concerns of people on lower incomes, and that was a good thing. However, <laughs> Moving from 2000 to 2015, uh, we have to uh, address the fact that not a lot has changed in terms of the indebtedness of what we would term really ordinary households, low to middle income households, working class if you want to put it in a political sense. Uh, the reality is that we, as households, owe it roughly, and at least it's sort of back of the back bracket sort of statistic, one and a half trillion uh, pounds. Um, 80% of which is in the form of mortgages and 20%, so therefore around 300 billion is in the form of consumer credit debt. Now that 300 billion pound figure is not one that you hear bandied around very often, um, and that's partly because it's drawn from the uh, national accounts and not from the figures that the Bank of England put out. The Bank of England put out a separate data set which actually suggests that around 175, 178 billion pounds is outstanding in consumer credit not the 305 I've just mentioned. 
Oh, what's the what's the reason for the discrepancy in these figures? Well, firstly, there's about £60 billion pounds of student loans, which can add to 178, so that takes you to around £238 billion. And then there's £70 billion, pounds, which is largely unaccounted for, um, but can be, uh, we think, and this is some work that we're doing for the TUC at the moment, can be, we think, accounted for by acknowledging that the Bank of England figures are the amounts that are outstanding on lender balance sheets that are reported to them. And what's taken place over the last particularly five, uh, five or six years has been a shift off balance sheets for lots of debts which people are struggling to repay, which are bought up by private equity companies, often very cheaply, are still pursued from households, but which are not actually reported by the main lenders to the Bank of England. So there's a big discrepancy in those sorts of figures. Now, even if we were to say that that figure is probably around 30 to 50 billion, something like that, you can see that that has an enormous economic impact in terms of dragging down domestic demand, household consumption, particularly, I have to say, in households who have the least money already or in uh, the greatest financial difficulties. So actually depressing their consumption has an economic impact uh, which we can't ignore. And this is you know, a similar figure to the amount which uh, Osborne is uh, currently seeking to uh, drag out of the, uh, the welfare bill as well. So you know, we're not talking small sums of money here. This is quite a big economic impact. The economic importance of consumer credit and indebtedness has never really been centre stage in terms of the political debate in this country. And that's bizarre, frankly. Why is it that household indebtedness has never been treated with the same kind of regard economically as, let's say, uh, the firm's company's <coughs> indebtedness or, let's say, the financial sector's uh, liabilities themselves. It's all part of the same picture in terms of how our economy is operating. And of course, the reduction in national debt through austerity measures is likely to force household debt to increase further. These two things are related. If you take money out of people's pockets in the form of austerity and cuts to drive down the national debt, or in the name of doing so, whether it's effective or not, in the name of doing that, then actually you're relying upon people maintaining their living standards by increasing their use of financial services and credit, particularly if they're in circumstances such that they cannot cut back on expenditure any further. And that, of course, is the position. If you take money out of tax credits for people and there is no subsequent increase in wages for people, then you are driving them further and further into the arms of high cost lenders in many cases who will exploit them and take more money out of their uh, household budgets. And that actually, in a nutshell, is what has happened not just under Osborne and Cameron in terms of their austerity, but actually over the last 40 years, we've seen an increasing uh, drive to financialize society, to erode the welfare state, to disband trade unionism and organised labour and attack that such that wages are stagnant or low over a period of time, or at least real wages are stagnant or low over a considerable period of time. And that has driven people to use financial services, whereas previously the welfare state would have provided for them. There are some obvious examples as to where this has taken place, and I mentioned student loans just a moment ago. But clearly, the move away from grants to student loans is the financialization of education, <coughs> higher education. And that has huge impacts moving forward for us as an economy. Equally, if we look at pensions, we've had to move away from you know, a, a decent state pension that uh, actually delivers dignity and retirement uh, for, for, for the elderly, to an increasing reliance upon private provision. Similarly, in terms of housing, the erosion and, in fact, you know, rather pathetic uh, social house building programmes that we've had, particularly in terms of the move away from council house building to housing associations, 
which was forced through. That has consequences in terms that if you want any security of tenure, if you want to be able to choose where you live, then you're forced into the mortgage market. And of course, through right to buy, the stock of council housing has also been decreased. But the answer to that, that the financial services industry came up with, was of course to extend mortgages to people who previously wouldn't have qualified for them, subprime mortgages. And that did therefore drive up the demand for mortgages, the demand for the available stock to buy, and consequently led to an increase in house prices and a bubble in that sector of the economy. And that, unfortunately, is being repeated again now. We've not seen the link that we need to see between mortgage availability and housing stock growth. Yeah, and that should be an explicit target I'm probably saying this because Anne's in the room, she's got the ear of Corbyn and I know McDonald's uh, just uh, launched uh, a review of the Bank of England's uh, sort of remit. But it should be an explicit target of the Bank of England to maintain house prices at an affordable level given what's going on in terms of income. And one of the means of doing that, of course, is either to restrict availability to mortgages, by which I mean not that people shouldn't be able to get mortgages, but there needs to be a link between the, the amount of mortgage lending that's taking place and house building programs such that uh, bubbles of that nature don't arise. There are other things, of course, which need to, to be done in terms of the consumer credit side of things. And it would be logical for government to, and the Bank of England, to adopt a joint target to reduce levels of household debt. It's patently clear that £305 billion of household debt is unsustainable. The interest on that alone, if you just did a back of a fag packet calculation, 10%, let's say, and credit card rates are much higher than that, around 18 to 19%, just 10% takes £30 billion out of the economy straight away. And, you know, that money is not being lent out in other productive sectors of the economy which would actually benefit us in terms of growth. And the, the, the reason for that is that interest rates and returns are much higher when lending to the household sector than they often are in terms of the long-term investment that we need in industry and in other sectors of the economy. And whilst returns are higher, it is rational for markets to allocate capital to those sectors, the household sector, in terms of driving the indebtedness rather than to those sectors of the economy which could actually boost growth, create jobs and indeed lead to uh, higher wages.